looking. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a few quick notes for you on the screen. So if you don't mind turning off your cell phone uh, or turning off the ringer, but please feel free to share anything from this session with the hashtag GDHF2022. Um, and then just a note that we look forward to this being a participatory session. So we look forward to your participation, but really just wanna thank you for being here with us uh, for elevating women's leadership in digital health. My name is Lauren Wall. I'm a deputy director with Digital Square, an initiative at PATH, and I oversee capacity strengthening and program implementation. I'm here with Olivia Velez, who really, I think, needs no introduction at the forum. If you don't know, she's the chief digital officer at IntraHealth, and she is also the co-chair of uh, Global Digital Health Network. I owe you an apology, Olivia, because there is a glitch on the platform, and I am still listed as co-chair for the network. That's okay. Uh, that is not true anymore. Share leadership. <laughs> um, so the initiatives that we'll focus on today are ones that through my work with Digital Square, I've had the opportunity to partner with. Um, and we'll actually be hearing from Olivia, but we'll also be hearing from two uh, panelists that aren't able to be here with us in person today who will join us uh, through video. And one of them is also with us in the chat on the online forum, if that is something you are interested in seeing. And we'll have one of my colleagues connecting us here in the room to that online forum as well. Okay, to get us started, uh, take about 30 seconds to find someone next to you, introduce yourself if you don't know them, and just share the word that comes to mind when you're thinking about women's leadership in digital health. So we'll take about 30 seconds to do that now. Don't be shy. <laughs> You have about 15 seconds left. Wrap up your conversations. All right. Hopefully you found a good stopping point. Uh, Olivia, out of curiosity, what's your one word? Partnership. Partnership. All right. Let's hear from our audience. Anyone want to shout out their one word? Their one word that came to mind. Empowerment. Insufficient. <laughs> Powerful. Central. Central. <laughs> Inclusion. Let's get a few. Minority. Minority. Let's get one more. Multitasker. Multitasker. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you all so much. A little taste of that's just getting you warmed up for the participation we're looking for later and hopefully you might have had the opportunity to meet someone new. So how we'll use this time today, we'll very briefly touch on the digital gender gap and then talk about why the role of women in leadership for digital health is important and how it affects that gap. From there, we'll go on to our panelists' presentations. We'll hear from each one of our panelists about programs that they are implementing that help elevate women in leadership in digital health. We'll go into a very brief Q&A and then some group activity. Uh, and then we'll hear from all of you. All right, we'll just start a little bit with the digital gender gap. Why are we here? Why does this matter? I always think back to when M Health started. Can anyone else remember when this was the M Health Summit? I know a few of you do. Um, M Health, digital health, as having this great potential to uh, help women advance their autonomy and equity when it comes to health. There's great potential to empower women through digital, but uh, we know that this is not actualized. Data shows that digital has the ability to help women have better access to information and care, but this is just currently 
unrealized, and inequality in access still persists. And in fact, progress in equity and equality in access has stalled. So women are currently 18% less likely to own a smartphone than men. So one of the primary ways for women, for people to access uh, the internet, health records, health services through smartphones. Um, and that totals to 315 million women, less women than men, that own smartphones. And currently only 60% of women access mobile internet. One of the primary ways for people to access internet in low and middle income countries. And this is actually stagnant. So for the past few years, we've been hanging out at around women being 15 to 16% less uh, likely uh, than men, though um, in about the past seven years, we have seen improvement um, up from 25%. But this means that 264 million women do not access, uh, less than men access mobile internet. It's a total of 912 million women. 912 million women do not access mobile internet. All the while, we are rapidly digitalizing not only provider-facing systems, but client-facing systems. We are creating personal health records, and we have 912 million women that don't access mobile internet. And these trends hold across various economic levels, uh, various ICT levels, geographies, and so in lower, middle, high-income countries, these trends uh, hold true. So what else do we know? We know uh, from research that women in leadership positions compared to their male counterparts respond more to the needs of women and other marginalized peoples um, in terms of their concerns. Great. So where are our women leaders in digital health? Globally, women are less represented in ICT. Uh, so we can see here um, the global enrollment of, of women in industries. Um, and we see that in ICT, it's around 30%. And if we look at top conferences, for example, on AI, women make up sometimes as little as 12% of the presenters. So our hypothesis is that women must have representation in digital health leadership, decision making, evaluation, planning, in order to have the concerns of women represented so that we are increasing and advancing women's equity in digital health as we undergo rapid digitalization. Okay, this brings us to the fun part. So we have three women leaders themselves in digital health that will be uh, presenting today on their initiatives to advance women's leadership in digital health. So these women, very impressive women leaders in, in digital health on their own, but have also turned their efforts, again, there we're seeing women in leadership positions advocating for women. They're using their positions to run these programs. Uh, so our first presenter, she is with us online. Hi, Jocelyn is Jocelyn Carillas. She's the general manager for RECAINSA, which is the Central American Health Informatics Network. So fun fact about Jocelyn, she and I met at the forum in 2019. We in fact share matching pins. I hope she's wearing hers today. Um, and we connected here at the forum and became friends and colleagues. And she will be discussing uh, a program that RECAINSA is running uh, promoting women's leadership in digital health. Then we'll hear from Olivia. So Olivia, as I mentioned, is the Chief Digital Health Officer at IntraHealth and also co-chair of the Global Digital Health Network. This year, Olivia has been part of a program called Women Lift. And Olivia has taken her own experience as a participant in Women Lift, which is uh, supporting women in their leadership journeys to turn it into something that supports other women in their digital health leadership journeys. Then finally, we'll hear from Nadine Karema, Nadine is the Deputy Executive Director for Partners in Health Rwanda. Uh, Nadine started with Partners in Health Rwanda as their Chief Informatics Officer, um, and she has been working on a program called Digital Health Applied Leadership Program. So this is not a women-specific program, but she'll be sharing some of the approaches that the program has taken to supporting women in digital health. All right, 
So get comfy. We're going to start with our video from Jocelyn. Her program is Mujeres Líderes en Salud Digital, Women Leaders in Digital Health. Hello, everyone. I am Jocelyn Carillas, General Manager at Recaínsa, and it is an honor for me to be virtually with you from Guatemala City and to be part of the Global Digital Health Forum 2022. I would have definitely loved being in person and share with you a cup of coffee or maybe a glass of wine. So thank you to the Global Digital Health Forum team for allowing me to join you remotely and to make it possible for me to share about this great experience. Today, I will have the pleasure to talk with you about women's leadership in digital health in Latin America. And for those of you who are not yet familiar with the work that Recaínsa is doing, I want to tell you that Recaínsa is a digital health network formed by Latin American volunteers and professionals working in the health and information technology sector. And it was created in 2013 with the intention of supporting national digital health strategies and generating spaces for the change of experiences and best practices in both the public and private sector. From Recaínsa, we joined the global effort led by the World Health Organization to promote and boost access and universal health coverage through the digital transformation in health, which allows the implementation of national strategies that have a significant impact on the efficiency and quality of health systems, contributing this is to reduce the inequities that affect the countries of Latin America. We have four strategic objectives that are to strengthen governance in digital health, to promote the training of workforce in digital health, to strengthen spaces for the exchange of knowledge and best practices in digital health, and to generate evidence in digital health for decision makers. So to start with the topic, given the central role that science, technology, and innovation plays as essential elements in digital health, but mainly for a better social economic development at a global level, it is of great importance that women participate fully and equitably in these activities. While it is true that in recent decades, we have experienced significant progress, there are still many obstacles that hold us back. These gender gaps are difficult to measure because unfortunately, there are few data and evidence to study these dynamics and even more so in digital health. And before we speak about leadership in digital health, we need to speak about gender equity. Although the gender gap has been narrowing in recent years, there are still horizontal and vertical barriers that, that are reflected in a reduced female presence in certain disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, in occupations that are strongly male-dominated and that leave women with difficulties in reaching top leadership positions in several areas of organizational systems. Today, access to and use of information and communication technologies 
are key to expanding women's opportunities. So technological advances are having a major impact on the way we work, the way we learn, and in general, the way we interact. Having access to new technologies and having the necessary skills to use them is essential to, to reap the benefits that technological advances can bring. For example, improving our chances of getting a job on and to minimize their risk, for, for example, unemployment as a result of automation. The jobs of the future are in these areas mentioned before, where women have been historically underrepresented. Topics such as health in times of pandemics, the fight against climate change, telecommunication in a globalized world, or robotics and artificial intelligence. Rarely extensively on these disciplines which have the potential to provide the skills needed to achieve more prosperous, sustainable, and inclusive societies in light of the Millennium Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. So speaking about the labor gap, uh, esteem occupations are the highest earning occupations, but have the lowest percentage of female workers. Very complex factors determine the disparities between men and women in their access to STEM as early as school and deepening in college and the world of work. For example, only three in 10 students in STEM majors and programs, two in 10 artificial intelligence professionals, and one in 10 machine learning researchers are women. And only 3% of Nobel Prizes in science have been awarded to women. According to figures from UNESCO Institute for Statistics, uh, in July 2019, the average global rate of women researchers was only 29.3%, while in the region, according to available data on the proportion of women researchers in each country, about 27% of the countries had managed to achieve what is characterized as gender parity, where women represent between 45% and 55% of the total number of researchers. And what about the salary gap? Although female participation in the labor force increased significant, significantly until 2000s, the hourly remuneration of women in the region is on average 17% lower than of men of the same age with the same education level same number of children in the household, same mm -hmm. geographic condition, and same type of work. This also responds to the fact that women receive research grants for lower amounts than men. And what about leadership? Well, historically, women have always faced greater bar barriers than men in achieving leadership position and in all societies at all levels of development. While the issue of women's underrepresentation in politics, business, and public administration has gradually caught people's attention, gender-based discrimination in science and technology has yet to receive 
adequate attention. So closing the digital divide definitely requires the concerted cooperation of all social agents, governments, organizations, companies, academia, family, men and women. The changes we make today can guarantee a more inclusive and uh, uh, egalitarian digital future. At Recaínsa, we have prioritized the gender topic in all our projects and programs. In 2021, and thanks to the financial support of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, we created a training program called Women Leaders in Digital Health. This program was created with the intention of strengthening the competencies of women professionals from Latin America and the Caribbean working in both the, the health sector and the ICT sector, providing them with training to enhance their leadership, transformation, and digital health ca capabilities support their professional performance. This is a 12-week program that addresses very important aspects. For example, in the gender and leadership model, topics such as the international regulatory framework and human rights approach, as well as the importance of the different intelligences and competencies of a leader, among others, are addressed. Second, in the model of digital transformation uh, in health, we are strengthening capacities in topics such as transformation processes in organizations, organizational change management, organizational architecture and digital transformation in health, entrepreneurship and innovation. And finally, in the digital health model, we're addressing priority topics such as introduction to digital health, governance in digital health, and formulation and management of digital health projects. So, uh, we're almost uh, getting to the end of my presentation. And we are aware that we have some challenges for the future. And here are some uh, recommendations that we uh, from RECAINSA can make. Closing the gender gaps in digital health is, prior, is a priority to level the playing field and prevent women from being uh, left behind. Sustainable Development Goal 5, gender equality, which in its target 5.5, urges countries to work to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision making. So, among these challenges ahead are the need of creating action plans to support the design and the implementation of instruments and activities that, that encourage the participation of women in digital health. There is also an urgent need for ad hoc national strategies and policies to attract girls and women to esteem careers and professions that will enable them to occupy decision-making positions in the future. And to mention a couple of more recommendations, we must strengthen interinstitutional collaboration through for example, campaigns to promote and raise awareness 
of gender equality and women's leaders leadership in digital health and in health in overall. It is also necessary to encourage the debate and exchange of experiences and best practices of gender in digital health at local, national, regional, and global levels. And finally, to strengthen digital health networks and give participation and decision-making spaces to women is vital. So thanks uh, for having me here again. And um, I will leave uh, the floor open to any questions or comments. And if you have any um, specific uh, questions or do you, you you want to know more about our uh, program, uh, please you can reach me in the contacts that I share here with you. Thank you very much and looking forward uh, to see you soon. Bye-bye. Right, and there is our contact information. We can also share that with you afterwards. I guarantee you, if you use the hashtag GDHF2022, Jocelyn will find you. <laughs> so Jocelyn, thank you so much. It did actually feel like you were here in the room. Thank you for joining us virtually. Really, really appreciate it. We're gonna save questions that we'll do briefly during a Q&A after all of our panelists, which means it's on to Olivia. Um, and Olivia will be talking to us about Women Lift and what she took out of that experience. And I should also say part of this panel was actually inspired by the executive director of Digital Square, Sky Gilbert's Women Lift experience in which she focused on gender in leadership uh, and governance in digital health. So really nice connection there. Yes. So Olivia, take it away. Sure. So um, I, I want to preface this by saying I'm a Women Lift fellow. I do not run the Women Lift program. <laughs> Um, and there's actually a few of us uh, attending the conference who are current and former Women Lift Fellows. Um, Leona Rosenblum and uh, Nancy Pukkamer um, are also Women Lift Fellows, and uh, Jumana Quadrin, who was here yesterday for Switchpoint. Um, so Women Lift is a one-year leadership journey, um, and currently there are three active cohorts, a North American cohort, an East Africa cohort and an India cohort, and uh, hopefully in the future the program will be spreading to other regions. Um, so as part of that program, it's, it's for women who work in the global health space, not necessarily digital health. Um, you, you develop a leadership project, you get a year-long leadership training, um, and you really get to know a cohort of other, other women leaders in this space. Um, it's a really wonderful experience, and I highly recommend it uh, to anyone that's interested. Um, so for my project, um, you know, I was like, well, I'm in this role as co-chair of the Global Digital Health Network, and how can we tie women's digital health leadership to what we do at the forum? So, and part of my thinking around this, too, is like if, if you know, we don't have salary surveys and career surveys in, in, in the digital health space, you know, at least not, you know, globally. Um, so, you know, just from observations and discussions with friends and colleagues, you know, we know 70% of the health workforce is made up of women, but leadership roles are less than 50%, right? And so we can probably assume that it's sort of the same in digital health. Um, and then I also think the other thing is when women are in leadership positions, uh, we're often in kind of the unpaid uh, administrative leadership positions like co-chair of the Global Digital Health Network, uh, leading a technical working group, um, and, and kind of things that have a, a big administrative aspect to it and not things that are like I'm decision maker over funding or um, guiding a project um, and things like that. So, so I, I'm like, how do we get in these more decision-making, more power roles? How do we work and collaborate together? Um, and how do we, we just also move the needle on making digital health, moving it away from this um, competition space to a more collaborative space? Because we're really trying to solve difficult problems that need 
multiple organizations and multiple kind of implementers and you know, government participation um, through all levels of the government, health workforce participation, and I don't think we are going to accomplish that being very siloed and, and competing with each other, right? So I, I was just like, oh, you know, it'd just be great to just, like, let's get together in a room and talk about these things. Um, so we pulled together this workshop that took place on Sunday, um, and we did, it, we did just an open call. Anybody who wants to participate, just they did an application, and um, it really got narrowed down on who was going to be able to get here on Sunday and spend the whole day. Um, and just who heard about it in time to apply, though, really, I was like, to the, like, I don't know, two days before. Somebody's like, I'm going to be there. I'm like, okay, come. Um, we have plenty of food. So, uh, so there, there ended up being 25 of us in the room, and we had a, we had a, um, a trained coach and facilitator to, to walk us through the event. Um, and, and we did get some sponsorship from Prey Kelp Foundation and some in-kind support from JSI and um, from the Global Digital Health Network, um, and also from Lead for Good. So, so I just want to thank them while I'm up here. Um, and it, it was an amazing experience just to talk about, you know, all these shared things. So we had, we had women who didn't have a technology background who were saying, you know, I, I, I constantly hear, well, what do you have to contribute because I'm not a programmer and I don't know how to code. But again, our problems are bigger than just the technology, right? Like we're trying to solve complicated public health problems. You need public health expertise. We're trying to institute tools for health workers. You need health worker leadership. So. I think there was those kind of things that came up and that we discussed, but um, I think the big take home for me was like, um, and not only th through the workshop, but also through, through my Women Lift journey, is that we don't take advantage of mentorship and sponsorship, right? Like, we don't uh, actively seek mentors, um, you know, or we, we, we're afraid to ask for mentorship. Um, you know, we're afraid we're a burden on people, and, and a lot of people don't even know what sponsorship is. So, so I'm going to go through the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. So a mentor is somebody who can give you advice or guidance about, around your career. It might be your immediate supervisor. It might be a former coworker. It might be a professor. Um, but they can kind of guide you. You know, here's the skills that you need to attain. Here's... Um, some people or groups that you're organizations that you should be involved with. Um, and, and you can have multiple mentors. You don't need to have one. Um, we know in the NGO space, very few um, organizations have formal mentorship programs. I, you know, I think some of the bigger consulting firms do. I know ICF does <laughs> as a former ICF employee, but if our, our smaller NGOs don't really have this. So that makes it a challenge to find mentors. So you have to actively pursue those. Um, versus a sponsor. So what is a sponsor? A sponsor is somebody who really helps progress your career into a leadership role. So they, they, they are somehow in a position of power, um, and they, they're usually able to do four things for you. So the first is to amplify your message, right? They, like, I'm on this stage, and, and I get up, and I, I say, and you should really check out Lauren's work that she's doing in X, Y, and Z because it's really amazing, whether she's in the room or sitting next to me or not. But I, I take the advantage of having a platform and having a stage to amplify what Lauren's doing. Um, there's also boosting up people, so providing reference letters or if somebody tells me they're hiring for a job and I can say, oh, have you talked to... Um, this person is a possible candidate. They're, they're uh, really great and, you know, say whatever about them um, to make those kind of connections, right? Um, then there's just generally connecting, um, which I think Sarah Romini in the room, like we did yesterday, we were talking about some work in uh, Tomorrow or Less that we're going to start. And she's like, I'm going to connect you with the technical working group. And it comes with her credibility that she already has with them. And so she's sharing her credibility for, for me and for, for my team. Um, so that's really important. And then the final thing is, is defending. Um, so, you know, we, there's all negative experiences. We know these things happen. Um, and I, th I think especially as women, right, we're more likely to, you know, if we're, I don't know, forceful, we're called aggressive, right, <laughs> or angry or whatever. So... Um, 
you know, being able to, to use your power and your influence to say, hey, you know, actually that person is not an aggressive person, you know, they're actually really nice to work with, you know, or, um, you know, I, I, I often think of, you know, especially if we think of women who have been in high, uh, high up leadership roles, who've been disparaged and had horrible things said about them, you know, being able to say like that, you're, you're letting your gender biases <laughs> kind of skew what you're saying um, and, and supporting that and, and speaking up about that. So that's what a sponsor does. And it's important in your career to have both mentors and sponsors. Um, and, and so I, I'm gonna give tips about how I found mentors and sponsors, uh, you know, and, and it might not work for, for everyone. I, I know one, I, if anybody who knows me, I'm very extroverted. <laughs> you know, I will I will talk to anyone about anything at all times, um, and I think that has made it easier for me to find mentors. But you can you know you can read read books like Quiet and talk to other introverts and they'll, they'll give you tips about how to do it. But I I think you know if if you don't have a formal mentorship um, program at your job, you know feel free to you know reach out to people who you see doing the things that you want to do, having the careers you want to have, or, or having con the connections you want to have, and, and just say, hey, can we have a 30-minute coffee chat, you know, virtual, um, you know, and, and you'll, you'll find that most people, they want to talk, <laughs> you know, and most people are willing to talk, yeah, we're, you know, we're all busy, um, but, you know, I, like, I want to share my knowledge, and I want to see other people do good, and I want to hear what you're doing, because it's probably, you know, really cool and interesting. Um, so I think that's a way to, to, you know, you don't have to make it super formal. You just say, you know, set up times to chat and then say, hey, can I, you know, you have a chat and if it's great and you click, can we talk again in, in three months or like next time something happens or I heard about this job, do you know somebody there? It's, you know, they're not difficult asks and um, I think again it, it fosters this feeling of collaboration and, and also you never know when these things are, are going to come back to you. So. I know uh, Mohini Babasar is not here, um, and I, you know when I started advertising for this workshop, she she like I don't know what you call it on LinkedIn retweeted requoted, <laughs> but she you know on LinkedIn she she retweeted it and put this long description and she she wrote oh and it's great because Olivia is helping to organize this and she told this anecdote about how years ago that I had invited her to come in this room and give this talk, and I, I told her, stop letting all the guys talk for you. This is, this is your work, go and talk. And uh, so she went and did this presentation and how it you know, really helped spur her in leadership role. I was like, you know, and I emailed her and I was like, Juan Mohini, thank you for sharing this workshop because I want to get people to go. And I was like, and it's brought tears to my eyes and also I have no recollection of doing this, <laughs> you know? So, so, you know, you never know what you put out into the world and who it's gonna come back. And when I always think of Mohini, I'm like, she's such a rock star, she's so amazing. And that she even thinks I remotely helped her at any point in her career is uh, really touching to me. And like, it's, it's just a really nice feeling. So it, it, come, it gets paid back to you when you mentor, it gets paid back to you when you sponsor. Um, and, and we should give of ourselves, right? We all want to make the world better, and, and I think that's mentoring and sponsoring is, is definitely part of it. Um, please don't flood me with 99 email requests. I will, I will be out of town for the next week, but I, I, I am really happy to, to talk to people about careers. I'm happy to talk to people about the Global Digital Health Network, um, and, uh, and I don't know, I don't think my contact information's on the slide, but you can, you can get it. If, if you're not already connected to me on LinkedIn, I accept all requests. So uh, I think that's it for me. Great. Olivia, thank you. I want to point out that, right, Olivia ran this program on Sunday. And three months ago, I said, Olivia, you're going to join me on a panel and talk about the program that you ran two days prior. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to really quickly recap some of the things that I heard between these two presentations before we move on to Nadine. What I think is interesting is both of these programs, the one that Olivia created and, and delivered on Sunday, and Women Leaders in Digital Health were both embedded in larger networks. And so leveraging the power and the connection that those networks have. Uh, they were both uh, women specific what I think is one of the interesting kind of differences I've 
seen just in the past few minutes hearing about them is one is quite formalized, the one with Rekha and some women leaders in digital health, where Olivia's done something a little looser, a little more informal. And that also connects to what Olivia has been talking about in terms of mentorship and sponsorship, that most uh, places don't have these formal programs. And so there are these formal and informal approaches that can be um, leveraged for increasing women's leadership. So thanks very much, Olivia. We're gonna move on to one more video. This one's from Nadine Krema and Partners in Health. Um, and she is going to be talking about the Digital Health Applied Leadership Program. So this is our only instance of a non-female specific, a non-women specific program. And she'll be talking about some of the approaches that were used to support women within this program. My name is Nadine Karema. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Partners in Health Rwanda. Uh, as far as my professional background goes, I've uh, been involved in the healthcare and tech industry for 15 years now. And uh, my passion has been to nurture the next generation of informatics. Uh, and I started my career as an IT specialist and uh, I grew into uh, data specialization and informatics. And uh, prior to my new role as Deputy Executive Director for Partners in Health Rwanda, uh, I was helping to implement the electronic medical health records in uh, across Rwanda and advising the Rwanda Ministry of Health in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, EMR implementation, uh, providing technical support to the team responsible for digitalization of uh, health systems in Rwanda. And uh, it's been quite a, a journey. Uh, and now um, I'm sharing some of the lessons learned uh, by teaching, uh, having speaking engagements and uh, uh, mainly now with the DHLP, which is the Digital Health Applied Leadership Program that is managed by the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. And you will hear more about the DHLP from my colleagues. Uh, within the Digital Health Applied Leadership Program, I am serving as a digital health expert and leadership instructor for uh, francophone and anglophone countries that are part of the first cohort of five countries. Uh, the DHLP, as you might have heard or will hear uh, later, is a 12-month program. Uh, it aims at uh, preparing participants from uh, who are in digital health, involved in digital health in uh, governments in sub-Saharan Africa to successfully create and execute digital health interventions and digital health transformation initiatives for health systems in their countries. Uh, as part of my role, uh, I've been privileged uh, to have the room and the space uh, and the voice uh, to prioritize supporting women in leadership. And uh, the reason, the main reason really has been a bit selfish. It's because it's a lonely space. Uh, it's been lonely for me. Uh, and when I think about it, in terms of role model, I've never had a role model in um, digital health until now, because there's not enough representation. Uh, it's only through the DHLP that I've come across uh, women who are more senior than I am in digital health and that I've uh, been able to interact with and uh, consider as my informal mentor. Uh, and so I believe that there's uh, a room for more improvement to have women representation uh, because the more women we have, uh, the more advocacy we'll have for women-centered tools, uh, especially that these tools have, are mainly uh, implemented to support maternal and child health and 
family health, if I can call it. Uh, so a question that uh, I want you as um, the audience to contemplate during this session is how can we hold institutions more accountable for having a holistic equity approach uh, to include more women in digital health? And how can we do that uh, in terms of uh, the whole spectrum of interesting women to join digital health um, projects or careers, training them, mentoring them until they get to a leadership position into digital health. Uh, and um, we've tried that within the DHLP. Uh, and I have to admit that it, it's still quite a journey. Uh, we hope it will improve with more of the cohorts that we receive. Uh, but um, within the, the DHLP, when we design the project, uh, we were specific uh, and we spelled it out that we would ensure equity uh, and that it will be a required consideration uh, in country digital health projects. And we also made sure that we notify um, governments that were part of the first cohort that in the selection of participants that they would send us, they would have to address equity and make sure that uh, particularly gender equity is considered uh, so that uh, our end goal of ensuring accessibility and utilization of digital health uh, will be more inclusive of women. Uh, and of course, uh, a challenge has been that there's not a big pool of women to choose from uh, because not many women in Africa have a clear career path in digital health. So there's a need for more, um, more representation. Uh, in our DHLP approach, we tried working just with um, the smaller pool of women that we had or the smaller number of women that we were able to have uh, given the issues with the, the pool of women that we could choose from. We've ensured that uh, there is close uh, tutoring of these women, uh, encouraging them to stick through the program, uh, even if some of them are not in senior leadership in digital health. And we've also uh, made sure as much as possible that when there is an opportunity for a presentation or a research, we involve uh, women and uh, have an equity approach to that and make sure that as much as possible we give them the room and the space to um, discuss their perspective as women in digital health, their perspective in terms of uh, how they could be more involved in digital health and how uh, women can be uh, more leveraged in digital health projects. Uh, so, so far, because we are on our first cohort and we're not done, um, we can't talk much about um, impact, uh, only on intended outcomes. We want more women involved, or we want uh, to hear more the voice of women in digital health. Uh, but unfortunately, like I said, uh, the inputs must match the output. Uh, we have very few women in the program. And uh, like I said earlier, we hope that there will be an improvement. Uh, as far as improvement, sorry. As far as improvement goes, uh, we are hoping that uh, you as the audience uh, could be part of uh, a collective with us uh, so that we have uh, more intentionality, uh, more mentorship of women, 
more equity in selecting women for digital health, uh, be it in hiring, be it in uh, seconded positions at the ministries, and to create a bigger pool of uh, women to choose from. Uh, maybe we should also have more internship for women who are interested or young girls who are interested uh, in digital health. Uh, for some of the junior staff that uh, are already part of the ministries or organizations, we should maybe uh, <clears throat> make sure that uh, we encourage them to explore uh, some of the possibilities in the digital health field. And uh, we should also try as much as possible, uh, raise staff interest in digital health, women, female staff uh, interest in digital health uh, by creating some mini uh, projects, some innovative projects uh, that are funded by our partners so that together, as a collective, we build a better tomorrow where women are more involved in digital health, uh, they're where their skills are leveraged and where their voices are heard uh, so that we can have women-centric design of digital health uh, interventions and implementation that is not excluding them. Thank you very much. And thanks to Nadine. Again, thank you to all of you for going on this hybrid virtual in-person journey with us. And thank you to Nadine and Jocelyn for joining us virtually. So we'll do a few minutes of questions, particularly on some of the approaches that we've heard. Um, all of them have included cohort approaches. They have been formal and informal approaches, women-specific and smaller groups within non-women-specific programs connecting these to other larger networks um, and noting that they're all women-led uh, and women-designed programs. Nadine talked about recruitment targets and also mentorship um, and also engaging earlier career individuals. So all three of these programs have talked about later in the pipeline rather than early pipeline approaches. So we'll take a few quick questions about these approaches and then we'll break into our groups to talk about how we can apply some of these approaches in our own work. Let's see if we have any questions. Uh, a question should be for Olivia or for Jocelyn who can engage with us through the chat. And if you are online in the virtual forum, if you wanna type your question for Olivia in or your question to Jocelyn and Jocelyn can actually answer it in the chat, we'll also read out some of those here. Okay, it looks like we have one from the chat. There haven't been any questions. That's yet, great. But I did want to share <laughs> just a shout out um, to you, Olivia. Uh, this was from Mohini, who just wanted to say, <laughs> oh, Olivia, thanks for the shout out. You gave me a big push that day. Thank you. <laughs> and great to see Olivia living out some of her values and recommendations. Uh, we will leverage this time since we were running a little behind schedule to move on to a brief activity. So I thought there were going to be tables today and we'd all be seated around tables today, but we're not and that's just fine. But if you wanna find a group of people around you, we'll move into for about the next uh, 10 minutes, a discussion of how you could apply some of these or different approaches in your own work. And right, these don't have to be programs specifically aiming, you know, the program that's just around women's leadership. There are, I'm sure, programs that you are all working in that some of these approaches can be implemented to support women's leadership in uh, digital health. So we'll spend a few minutes talking with our groups. How could you adopt and apply some of these approaches, maybe some different approaches? What challenges would you anticipate or what challenges are you already experiencing in gender equity in your work? And how do you address them? What are your mitigation strategies? What are the anticipated outcomes of this? And then 
please identify one person from your group to represent your group. And we'll spend a few minutes with uh, representatives of the groups up here talking about perhaps what some of these uh, presentations in 2023 might look like if we implement these approaches. Okay, so find a group of individuals around you. We'll take about 10 minutes uh, to discuss these items. And we'll get a little music on in the background to get your creative juices flowing. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's good. This Sorry about the lack of tables. <laughs> oh, God. <no. laughs>
Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay. Maybe you are finding a nice place to wrap up your conversation. Thank you for joining us in such a participatory approach. So we would like to know what might we be seeing on the agenda at Global Digital Health Forum 2023 in terms of women's leadership. Or perhaps you and your group were talking about your own experiences, what you've seen work or not work in your own projects or workplace. So if you have each one of your representatives come join us here on stage, I think we were planning on having someone talk about the work from the Ministry of Health in Madagascar coming to join us. I think this group here was going to have someone come join us. So now is a great time to identify your representative. <laughs> Alice, I think your group surely will have someone to join us. Thank you. Thank you. So please come on up and take a seat. And Elena, I think you'll be sharing out what some of the folks in the virtual forum have been discussing. Hello again. Come on up. <laughs> Did you want to do the lectern? So, oh, is that okay? So Elena will start, and Elena is, uh, thank you for being our liaison with those that are joining us in the virtual forum. And so Elena, maybe at the lectern you can start. Let's hear a little bit about what the folks in the virtual forum have been discussing. Okay. Give me one moment here. Just a, a 60 second summary, perhaps, Elena. Okay, there's a lot here, so <laughs> give me one sec. Well, a lot of people have been really been sharing about their own, um, just their own strategies, and maybe I will read actually Jocelyn's great response, if that's sure. okay. Um, so Jocelyn shared, the digital health industry, including entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems, plays a very important role in the digitization digitization of health services, given that the main function of ministries of health and other providers is not the production of digital health solutions, but of specialized companies and organizations whose line of business is this. This also reinforces the need for specialized human resources in the areas of health informatics, digital health project management, change management for the digitization of processes and other subspecialties. So the training role of universities and specialized training centers is extremely important, but also the economic recognition for digital health professionals who invest in their training. So incorporating these roles and profiles, both in health, health institutions and in industry, is crucial to, the close, to close the cycle of skills training. And this got many likes and reactions in the chat. So I think it's a, a great summary of what was going on in that conversation. Elena, thank you. And thank you, Jocelyn. And I like that that spoke to multiple points in the pipeline, which is something that's come up a few times today. So I'm wondering if I can pass the mic over here to hear really interesting work about what's been happening through the Ministry of Health of Madagascar in terms of women's leadership roles within the ministry. Thank you. Uh, I'm Fano Joseph. Uh, I'm working for GSI in Madagascar. We are supporting the Ministry of Health um, in the uh, strengthening of the health information system and malaria elimination and control. So, uh, what we've been, uh, what we, see, we, we, we saw in Madagascar uh, during the last uh, five years. There's a lot of uh, improvement in terms of involvement of women at leadership world uh, at all level or at all um, uh, level. Like at, um, if I start at the community level, we, we conducted a survey uh, last year uh, to see, uh, to localize the, the, to identify the, the community health worker. We realized that 75% of community health workers are women and uh, at the primary healthcare as well, 65% uh, uh, of uh, 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 um, facility uh, manager are uh, women. And uh, at the leadership uh, level, uh, like at the, 
a di direction level or the department of the, the different department of the Ministry of Health, like the MCH department, you know, um, I'm talking about MCH, uh, immunization, uh, uh, malaria control program, and so on. Um, there is uh, uh, um, a lot, uh, there is a, a huge involvement of women at this level. And this is based on a decision from the new government to increase the participation of women at all levels uh, of the government. Um, um, previously, it was, 30, uh, it was a, a ratio of 30% of women in the, should be involved in all, um, uh, at leadership uh, um, level, in the government and all the ministries. But from the, at the Ministry of Health, they increased this uh, uh, ratio for uh, to 45%, 45%. So 45% of women uh, of uh, leadership role are being led by women in Madagascar. So that is a huge uh, improvement compared to the uh, five previous years. This is uh, what uh, I, gonna, I, I want to share with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And talking about those intentional and very institutionalized targets uh, coming from the ministry and, and that uh, changing the way that the workforce is recruited. So we'll, I think we have time for about one more, if anyone wants to make a grab for the mic. Thank you. I'll just summarize what we were discussing in our group. Uh, my name is Rose Nzioka. So we, we talked about how the space for women leadership is a bit different when you look at the Americas, developed countries, vis-a-vis -vis the field offices, and we were talking about cultural sensitivity in that a lot of the times, especially in the global south, culturally women don't feel like they need to step up or speak up or take up uh, leadership positions, you know, like, you know, be aggressive about it. So we talked about how it's important to encourage them in meetings, call them out, give them tasks and responsibilities, try them out. At the leadership conference, we had three women, including Olivia, that were talking about how people took a chance on them. So how it's important to take a chance and give women responsibilities, especially considering that cultural uh, difference issue. Then we talked about also flexibility in working hours and supporting especially the women that are starting out in technical, uh, technical leadership roles where they also have family responsibilities, child care, you know, dealing with uh, challenges with uh, nannies, ETC. Like how can organizations support them like with flexi time and resources to enable them navigate those challenges because their male counterparts at the same time are not dealing with those issues. So with time you see the gap uh, increases and there's more, it's more disparate because they are having to deal with a lot more that male counterparts are not dealing with at the time. And then we also spoke about the place of men that men need to be engaged more in this dialogue because space is going to be created by the other gender as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I heard that topic of the role of men in this conversation come up across multiples of the groups. Thank you for raising that. Okay, we have come to the end of our time. Thank you, everyone. Again, thank you for going through this virtual and in-person journey with us. Thank you to those of you that joined us through the virtual platform. Please keep this conversation going with us. You can use hashtag GDHF2022 to keep the conversation going or come find any wonderful colleagues like these uh, four here um, and uh, our panelists as well. Thanks very much.